Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Ostara, and Chloe. And as always, I want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And in this next video, we will be getting into the summary analysis of chapters 11 through 15, and then we'll probably be reading chapter 16. And then, without further and without further ado, let's get into that. That. Alrighty, the summary to chapter 11, and this short chapter is devoted almost exclusively to Holden's recollections of Jane Gallagher sitting in a vomity-looking chair in the lobby of the Edmund Hotel. He remembers how they met and what they did this summer before his sophomore year. He thinks he knows her like a book. So he thinks, right? <laughs> they always think that about us women. Despite the late hour, Holden still is not tired. He decides to visit Ernie's nightclub in Greenwich Village. The analysis. If she is as Holden remembers her, Jane is probably the one whom Holden should be dating instead of Sally Hayes. Jane lived next door to his family's summer home in Maine. Holden met her after his mother complained to the Gallaghers about their doberman pincher's habit of relieving himself in the Caulfield's lawn. Holden clearly appreciate and appreciates and adores Jane, and she is someone he can talk with comfortably. Except for family members, she is the only person to whom he has shown Allie's baseball glove. Holden loves Jane's idiosyncrasies. He loves it that she played golf with her eyes closed and once lost eight balls in a single round. He loves it that she is mucklemouth, sending her lips in all directions when she's excited about something. She is telling him. He loves it that she keeps her kings in the back row when they play checkers. He loves holding hands with her. Once during the news reel of the movie, she touched the back of his neck in such a way that it made a huge impression on Holden. Jane does have a problem at home, however, it may be beyond Holden's capacity to understand completely. He notices that her alcoholic stepfather attempts to dominate her. And when Holden asks Jane what the problem is, she starts to cry. When Holden sits by her and tries to comfort her, she sobs. He kisses her all over her face. But he wants us to know that she wouldn't let him kiss her on the mouth. They weren't really necking. Jane is very young, but has a terrific figure. And Holden wonders if maybe her stepfather's tried to get wise with her. But she says that the man has not. It's unlikely that Jane would admit this kind of event to Holden. And he prefers to think of her as living in innocence, untouched by the seamier side of life. Even the hookers have left the lobby, and Holden wants to get out of the hotel for a while. He catches a cab and heads for Ernie's, a nightclub in Greenwich Village. Yeah, on to the next one. Summary and analysis of Chapter 12. Okay, the summary is on the way to er Ernie's. Holden discusses ducks, fish, and winter with the cab driver. At the club, Holden expresses his opinions concerning the aesthetics of performance. Ernie the, crowd in gen Ernie, the crowd in general, and the nearby couple in particular, Lillian Simmons, a former girlfriend of D.B., pops by his table with her. And Navy, his table with her, a Navy officer, Holden declines her invitation to join them, saying he was just leaving. Analysis. The cab driver's name is Horwitz. He is grouchy, somewhat twisted amateur zoologist. But at least he is willing to entertain Holden's inquiry about where the ducks in Central Park go in winter. Actually, Horwitz prefers to discuss the fish. He gruffly declares that the fish have a tougher time than the ducks. Fish spend the winter frozen in the ice, according to Horwitz. I know that uh, cold water fish, goldfish do well in in, uh, in, uh, in cold weather. Not well in hot. Learned that the hard way. Anyway, they take in nourishment through the pores in their bodies. His opinions are amusing, but the comic aspects of the scene depend on more on the nature of the dialogue. Holden and Horwitz sound like two old antagonists who have had this discussion a hundred times before and jump on each other's lines as ancient uh, acquaintances do when excited about controversial topic. Salinger beautifully captures the crisp, tough conversational sounds of the city through this dialogue. Holden's aesthetics are tested at the nightclub. Despite the very late hour, Ernie's is packed, mostly with students on Christmas break. Ernie is an extremely skillful piano player, but Holden thinks that he's become too slick. 
Ernie has a huge mirror in front of him and spotlight on his face so that the crowd will miss an expression. In a way, Ernie is like Holden's brother D.B. They both once were true artists in Holden's mind, but have sold out Ernie to the sycophantic fans in D.B. to Hollywood. Whatever. Perhaps reflecting Salinger's values, Holden feels that an artist should live only for his art, eschewing fans and fame. I, I mean, your fans are important. I mean, they're the ones that are listening to you. You know, I mean, yeah, it's great to feel good about it, but, um, you know, the people that you want to, you know, want to make them happy. It's not so much for the adoration, it's just, you know, just to make other people happy. And when he starts pandering to the crowd, showing up with high ripples on the keys, as Ernie does, he has lost his way. This crowd, of course, loves it, as Holden observes. People applaud for the wrong reasons, Ernie concludes with a very phony, humble bow. At a nearby table, some yellow looking guys talking to his date about an attempted suicide while copping a field under the table. Several critics have noticed the juxtaposition of sex and death in the novel. This scene that Ernie's being one of the more bizarre examples, Holden concludes that he is surrounded by jerks. Lillian Simmons, who used to date D.B., comes by Holden's table with her date, a naval officer. She is annoying in a bubbly, phony way that Holden finds particularly irritating. The only real thing about her may be her very big knocker. She loves to be noticed. Holden knows that she only wants to impress him so that he will tell D.B. about her, and he quickly declines her invitation to join Lillian and, Lillian and her date at their table. Having told her that he was just leaving, he heads back to the hotel. On to the next one. Okay. Let's get there quickly. Summary and analysis of Chapter 13. The summary. Summary. is holding his tired taxis and walks the 41 blocks back to the hotel wearing his red hunting cap with the ear flaps down, missing his pilfered gloves and bemoaning his cowardice. The elevator man, Maurice doubles as a pimp and offers to provide Holden with a female companionship for five bucks a throw or fifteen dollars for the night. Holden agrees to go for a throw in his room. Twelve twenty-two, but almost immediately regrets it. The hooker calls herself Sonny. Holden tells her his name is Jim Steele. Although they do little more than talk because Holden's more depressed and ready to have sex, Sonny says that her fee is ten dollars. Holden pays her only five and she leaves calling him a crumb bum. Analysis. Holden's reflection on his cowardice and inept fighting inability, in, in fa inept fighting ability, foreshadows events in the next chapter. He realizes that he is more likely to attack someone verbally. What frightens him most in such a conflict is having to look at the other fellow's face. As he waits for the prostitute, Holden passes time by brushing his teeth and changing his shirt. He confesses to being a little nervous and admits that he is still a virgin. The truth is that Holden, at age 16, seems to be what we might call a good kid. Hmm. I mean, later on, maybe, you know, he'll change. I don't, I don't exactly like everything. Like I said, he's a, he's, a, he's a teenager, though. When he's making out with a girl and she asks him to stop, he stops. No means no for Holden. He is interested in sex, but he doesn't quite understand how to get there. What he learns with Sonny is that he prefers not to get there with a prostitute, which is good. The whole scene is depressing rather than erotic for Holden. He has to get to know a girl and like her a lot before he is comfortable with intimacy. One of the likable things about Holden is that beneath it all, he has some healthy values. In addition, he has mixed feelings towards Sonny. She is very young, about Holden's age, and seems to be almost as nervous as he is. As Holden describes it, she crossed her legs and started jigging, jiggling this one foot up and down. She was very nervous for a prostitute. She really was. I think it was because she was young as hell. She was around my age, holding this depressed, as she is so young, leading this kind of life. It saddens him to think of her going to a store to buy the green dress that she has worn for him and that he hangs it in the closet so it won't get all wrinkly, as Sonny puts it in her childlike language. When Jim Steele says he is 22, she responds, Like fun you are. And yet there's something very spooky about Sonny. Holden tells us that this child with her squeaky little voice is much more frightening than a big old prostitute with a lot of makeup on her face and all. The names Sonny and Jim Steele are ironic. Neither name fits the person. 
Freudian critic's delight in analyzing their significance. Remember that Salinger's boyhood name, nickname was Sonny. What kind of Freudian slip is Salinger made by naming the prostitute Sonny? What has he revealed about himself? Still, some critics suggest is a strained attempt at phallic superiority. Holden needs a way out of this big mess. He promptly decides that an elaborate lie is best. He claims that he recently had surgery on his clavichord, which Holden may or may not know is an old musical keyboard instrument. He tells Sonny that the clavichord is located quite waist down the spinal canal. Sonny's response is to come on stronger. She sits on his lap and says he is cute. She says he reminds her of some guy in the movies. Then she starts talking crudely and Holden ends the session. Sonny says her fee is $10, but Holden insists on paying her only the five that Maurice mentioned. He fetches her dress from the, the closet and she leaves. Sonny again reminds us of a child as her parting curse is to call Holden the crumb bum. And on to the next. On to the next. Summary and analysis of chapter 14. Summary. It is dawn on Sunday, but the time... By the time that Sonny exits, Holden smokes a couple of cigarettes, reflects on his relationship with his deceased brother Allie, as well as his feelings about religion. He is summoned by a knock on the door. Sonny is returned more recent and demands the rest of the ten dollars. Holden resists and is roughed up by the pimp. The analysis. Although Allie does not appear as a character in the novel, he has a significant presence. When Holden gets very depressed, he sometimes talks sort of out loud to his younger brother. He does so after Sonny leaves. His communication with Allie is almost religious, a confession of Holden's boyhood lack of consideration for the kid in the hotel room. Holden repeatedly tells Allie out loud to get his bike and join him at the home of a childhood friend, Bobby Fallon. Holden once refused to take Allie with him when he and Bobby were going shooting with BB guns, and the guilt he feels about this incident prompts him to repeat those words, almost in an attempt to take back that day and do it differently. We've all done that. that. You know, little regrets. In bed, Holden has greater difficulty with conventional prayer. He wants to speak with Jesus, but can, can't. He likes Jesus, but finds the disciples annoying and considers himself an atheist. He's bothered that the disciples repeatedly let Jesus down, indicating the importance of friendship and loyalty to Holden. It is telling that, other than Jesus, Holden's favorite character in the Bible is that lunatic and all that lived in the tombs kept cutting himself with stones. He refers to Mark 5, 1 to 20, in which Jesus meets the troubled soul whose name is Legion, for we are many. That's usually a demon, a legion. That's what they always say. Possessed people, I am legion. Holden himself is a troubled and soul, and like the man from the tombs, resists being tamed. Recall that he tells us his story from a mental health clinic or sanitarium in California. It is little wonder that Holden identifies with the man of Madman Holden too is one of the legion, one of the many. Sonny and Maurice interrupt Holden's spiritual musings. They want the other five dollars. They say Holden offered owes them. Holden struggles, but is no match for the bigger, stronger, meaner Maurice. As if he has learned nothing from his fight with Stradlater, Holden also calls Maurice a moron. And is doubled over by a blow to the belly. <laughs> Nowadays, it'd be a lot worse than that. Sonny takes the five dollars from Holden's wallet and she and Maurice leave with the money. Holden vamps into a tough guy fantasy in which he has been shot and seeks revenge. He really do doesn't really feel <coughs> very tough though. <coughs> Got a sore throat. Instead he feels like committing suicide. So, on to the next one. <coughs> Summary and analysis of chapter 15. Summary. Holden was, wakes around 10 Sunday morning. He phones an old girlfriend, Sally Hayes, and makes a date to meet her at 2 p.m. to catch a theater matinee. <coughs> Holden checks out of the hotel and leaves his bags at a lockbox in Grand Central Station, eating a large breakfast, orange juice, bacon, and eggs, toast, and coffee. <clears throat> At a sandwich bar, he meets two nuns who are school teachers from Chicago, duly assigned to a convent way the hell uptown, apparently near Washington Heights. They discuss Romeo and Juliet, and Holden gives them a donation of ten dollars. I just got a uh, book today; it only cost a dollar. Uh, more, 
of Romeo and Juliet, and they do like a modern, they <coughs> modern description of um, well, they modernize it for us. I mean, it's Romeo and Juliet, but they give us modern explanations to correlate with with uh, this generation, this new generation, the analysis. Holden is confused about women, and that shows my throat's itching <clears throat> in his relationship with Sally Hayes. Sally is everything that Jane Gallagher is not. Conventional, superficial, stupid, and phony. She knows about theater and literature. <coughs> Nothing wrong with that. And for a while, that fooled Holden to thinking she was intelligent. But she used words like grand, as in I'd love to, love to grand. So what? Big deal. So, I mean, you can tell he's a kid. But I mean, like I said, I, I think the book is overrated. Just my opinion. I mean, you know, everybody has their own opinions. And annoys with her pretense. Briefly, Holden wishes he had not called her. However, Sally is someone to spend the day with. And she is very good looking. Holden is both drawn to and repelled by her. At least he knows what to expect. Holden dislikes the theater almost as much as the movies. Both are contrived and artificial. The audience plod for the wrong reasons, just as they did at Ernie's. Now, I, I, I love the, you know, theater. And, you know, not <laughs> he thinks it's phony, but, you know, sometimes in life, you know, when I think we need things like that. We need to become someone else because, you know, everything is just so crazy. I mean, become someone else, become more of ourselves, and learn a little bit of everything. You know, and I, I don't think he's a really bad person. But he needs to learn a little bit more. We all do. I mean, I certainly did when I was that age. Still do. Anyway. The meeting with the nuns further reveals Holden's aesthetics, his sense of taste in the arts, because one of the nuns is an English teacher. I guess they begin to discuss Shakespeare's tragedy, Romeo and Juliet. It is no surprise that Holia, Holden's excuse me, favorite character is Mercutio, Romans, Romeo's glib, subversive best friend. I've never read Romeo and Juliet, by the way, so I'll be learning with you. Holden resents betrayal, even accidental betrayal, and he dislikes Romeo after the hero inadvertently causes Tybalt to kill Mercutio. Mercutio is Holden's kind of guy, bright and fun, a bit of a smart mouth. Holden finds the drama quite moving, but we suspect that he would have preferred a play in which Mercutio is the main character. Holden feels good about the donation he has given to the nuns, but he is becoming concerned about money. He left Pensy with quite a lot of dough because his grandmother just sent him a lavish birthday gift. She has a faulty memory and sends him birthday money several times a year, but Holden is careless with money. What he doesn't spend, he loses. He rather foolishly paid for all of the drinks with the tourist girls at the Lavender Room, and he dropped ten bucks, considerable amount of money in 1949, on Sonny. Now he faces a date with Sally, who might suspect he is not low maintenance. And that's the end of the summary and analysis. And let's get on to the reading of chapter 16. Okay. With the, yeah, okay, reading of chapter 16. After I had my breakfast, it was only around noon, and I was in meeting old Sally till 2 o'clock, so I started taking this long walk. I couldn't stop thinking about those two nuns. I kept thinking about that beat-up old straw basket they went around collecting money with when they weren't teaching school. I kept trying picture my mother or somebody or my aunt or Sally Hayes crazy mother standing outside some department store and collecting dough for poor people in a beat up old straw hat basket. It was hard to picture. Now see, you know, he said, he's kind of phony, you know. He makes a big deal a lot of money. I mean, he talks about phony people, but you know, you can't really have someone like this as a role model because, you know, seriously. Not so much my mother, but those other two. My aunt's pretty charitable. She does a lot of Red Cross work and all, but she's very well-dressed and all. When she does anything charitable, she's always very well-dressed. well, very well dressed. There's lipstick on and all that crap. I couldn't picture doing anything for charity if she had to work, wear black clothes and no lipstick while she was doing it. 
See, I mean, he's very, he's very shallow and vain in that respect, and, you know. And old Sally Hayes' mother, Jesus Christ, the only way she could go around with a basket collecting dough would be if any, everybody kissed her ass for when they were ma made a contribution. If they just dropped their dough in her basket and then walked away without saying anything to her, ignoring her and all, she'd quit about an hour. She'd get bored. She'd hand in her basket and then go someplace swanky for lunch. That's what I liked about those nuns. Well, you know, at least he's saying that he did like the nuns better for that reason. You could tell, for one thing, that they never went anywhere swanky for lunch. It made me so damn sad when I thought about it. They're never going anywhere swanky for lunch or anything. I knew it wasn't too important, but it made me sad anyway, and it isn't important. Started walking over toward Broadway just for the hell of it, because I hadn't been over, I hadn't been over there in years. Besides, I wanted to find a record store that was open on Sunday. There was this record I wanted to get for Phoebe called the Little Shirley Beans. It was a very hard record to get. It was about a little kid that wouldn't go out of the house because two of her front teeth were out and she was ashamed to. I heard it at Pensy, a boy that lived on the next floor had it. And I tried to buy it off him because I knew it would knock little Phoebe out, but he wouldn't sell it. It was a very old, terrific record that this colored girl singer, Estelle Fletcher, made about 20 years ago. She sings it very Dixieland and, and whorehouse, and it doesn't sound at all mushy. If a white girl was singing it, she'd make it sound cute as hell, but old Estelle Fletcher knew what the hell she was doing, and it was one of the best records I ever heard. I figured I'd buy it in some store that was open on Sunday, and then I'd take it up to the park with me. It was Sunday, and Phoebe goes roller skating in the park on Sundays quite frequently. I knew where she hung out mostly. It wasn't as cold as it was the day before, but the sun still wasn't out, and it wasn't too nice for walking. But there was one th nice thing. This family that you could tell just came out of the ch of some church were walking right in front of me. A y father, a mother, and a little kid, about six years old. They looked sort of poor. The father had on one of those pearl gray hats that poor guys wear a lot when they want to look sharp. He and his wife were just walking along, talking not paying any attention to their kid. The kid was swell. He was walking in the street instead of on the sidewalk, but right next to the curb. He was making out like he was walking a very straight line the way kids do. And the whole time he kept singing and humming. I got up closer so I could hear what he was singing. He was saying, singing that song, If a body catch a body coming through the rye. He had a pretty little voice too. He was just singing for the hell of it. You could tell. The car zoomed by, brakes screeched all over the place. His parents paid no attention to him, and he kept on walking next to the curb and singing. If a body catch a body coming through the rye, it made me feel better. It made me feel so depressed, not so depressed anymore. Broadway was mobbed and messy. It was Sunday and only about 12 o'clock, but it was mobbed anyway. Everybody was on their way to the movies. The Paramount or the Astor or the Strand or the Capitol or one of those crazy places. Everybody was all dressed up because it was Sunday. And that made it worse. But the worst part was that you could tell they all wanted to go to the movies. I couldn't stand looking at them. I can understand somebody going to the movies because there's some, nothing else to do. But when somebody really wants to go and even walks fast so as to get there quicker, then it depresses the hell out of me. Especially if I see millions of people standing in one of those long, terrible lines all the way down the block. Waiting with this terrific patience with seats and all. Boy, I couldn't get out that goddamn Broadway fast enough. I was lucky. The last, the first record store I went in to had a copy of Little Shirley Beans. They charged me five bucks for it because it was so hard to get. But I didn't care. Boy, it made me so happy all of a sudden. I could hardly wait to get to the park to see if old Phoebe was around so that I could give it to her. When I came out of the record store, I passed this drug store, and I went in. I figured maybe I'd give old Jane a buzz and see if she was home for vacation yet. So I went in my phone booth and called her up. The only trouble was her mother answered the phone, so I had to hang up. I didn't feel like getting involved in a long conversation at all with her. I'm not crazy about talking to a girl's mother on the phone anyway. I should have at least asked her if Jane was home yet, though it wouldn't have killed me, but I didn't feel like a, you really had to be in the mood for that stuff. I still had to get those damn theater tickets, so I bought a paper and looked up to see what shows were playing. On account of it was Sunday. There was only about three shows playing, so what I did was I went over and bought two orchestra street seats for I Know My Love. 
was a benefit performance or something. I didn't want much want to see it, but I knew old Sally, the um, queen of the phonies, would start drooling all over the place when I told her I had tickets for that because the loot, the lunts were in it and all. She liked shows that are that are supposed to be very sophisticated and dry and all, for the lunts and all. I don't. I don't like any shows very much. If you want to know, the truth. he sounds boring to me. They are not as bad as movies, but there's certainly nothing to rave about. In the first place, I hate actors. They never act like people. They just act they think they do. Some of the good ones do in a very slight way, but not in a way that's fun to watch. And if any actor's really good, you can always tell he knows he's good. And that spoils it. You take Sir Lawrence Olivier, for example. He was also in The Wuthering Heights. I think that was him. But anyway, I saw him in Hamlet, D.B., took Phoebe, and I, I to see it last year. He treated us to lunch first, and he took us. He'd already seen it, and the way he talked about it at lunch, I was anxious as hell to see it, but I didn't enjoy it much. I just don't see what's so marvelous about Sir Lawrence Olivier. That's all. He has a terrific voice, and he's a hell of a handsome guy, and he's very nice to watch when he's walking or dueling or something. But he wasn't at all the way D.B. said Hamlet was. He was too much like a goddamn general instead of a sad, screwed-up type guy. The best part in the whole picture was when old Ophelia's brother, the one that gets in the duel with Hamlet at the very end, was going away and his father was giving him a lot of advice. While the father kept giving him a lot of advice, told Ophelia was, uh, old Ophelia was sort of horsing around with her brother taking his dagger out of the holster and teasing him and all while he was trying to look interested in the bull his father was shooting. It was nice. I got a big bang out of that. But you don't see that kind of stuff much. The only thing old Phoebe liked was when when Hamlet patted this dog on the head. She thought that was funny and nice, and it was. What I'll have to do is I'll have to read that play. The trouble with me is I always love to have to read that stuff by myself. If an act actor acts out, I hardly listen. Yeah, that's true. I do prefer the book myself. That part's true. I keep worrying about whether he's going to do something phony every minute. After I got the tickets to the lunch show, I took a cab up to the park. I couldn't, I should have taken a subway or something because I was getting slightly low on dough, but I wanted to get off that damn Broadway as fast as I could. It was lousy in the park. It wasn't too cold. It wasn't too cold, dog, and where did I go? But the sun still wasn't out. And there didn't look like there was anything in the park except dog crap and globs of spit and cigar butts from old men. And the benches all looked like they'd be wet if you sat down on them. It made you depressed, and every once in a while, for no reason, you got goose flesh while you walked. It didn't seem at all like Christmas was coming soon. It didn't seem like anything was coming, but I kept walking over to the mall anyway. Because that's where Phoebe usually goes when she's in the park. She likes to skate near the bandstand. It's funny. That's the same place I used to like to skate when I was a kid. When I got there, though, I didn't see her around anywhere. There was a few kids around. Skating and all, and two boys were playing. Fly-ups with a soft ball, but no Phoebe. I saw one kid about her age, though, sitting on a bench all by herself, tightening her skate. I thought maybe she might know Phoebe and could tell me where she was or something. So I went over and sat down next to her and asked her, Do you know Phoebe Caulfield by any chance? Who she said all she had on was jeans and about 20 sweaters. You could tell her mother made them for her because they were lumpy as hell. Phoebe Caulfield? She lives on 71st Street. She's in the fourth grade over at, You know Phoebe? Yeah, I'm her brother. You know where she is? She's in Miss Callan's class, isn't she? The kid said, I don't know. Yes, I think she is. She's probably in the museum then. We went last Saturday, the kid said. Which museum, I asked her. She shrugged her shoulders, sort of. I don't know, she said. The museum. I know, but the one where the pictures are on the one where the Indians are. The ones where the Indians? Thanks a lot, I said. I got up and started to go, but then I suddenly remembered it was Sunday. This is Sunday, I told the kid. She looked up at me. Oh, then she isn't. She was having a hell of a time tightening her skate. She didn't have any gloves on or anything, and her hands were all red and cold. I gave her a hand with it. Boy, I hadn't had a skate key in my my hand for years. It, did, it didn't feel funny though. You could get a skate key in my, my hand in 50 years from now and pitch dark and I'd still know what it is. She asked me and all, thanked me and all and when I had it tightened for her. She was a very nice, polite little kid. God, I love it when a kid's nice and polite when 
you tighten their skate for them or something. Most kids are, they really are. I asked her if she'd care to have a hot chocolate or something with me, but she said no thank you. She said she had to meet her friend. Kids always have to meet their friend. That kills me. Even though it's Sunday and Phoebe wouldn't be there with her class or anything, and even though it was so damp and lousy, I, I walked all the way through the park over to the Museum of Natural History. I knew that was the museum the kid with the skate meant. I knew that whole museum routine like a book. Phoebe went to the same school I went to when I was a kid. And we used to go there all the time. We had this teacher, Miss Egeltinger, that took us there damn near every Saturday. Sometimes we looked at the animals, and sometimes we looked at the stuff of the Indians that had made in ancient times. Pottery and straw baskets and all stuff like that. I get very happy when I think about it. Even now, I remember after we looked at all the Indian stuff, usually we went to see movies in this big auditorium, Columbus. They were always showing Columbus discovering America, having one hell of a time getting old Ferdinand and Isabella to lend him the, the dough to keep by ships with, and then the sailors mutinying on him and all. Nobody gave too much of a damn about old Columbus, but you always had a lot of candy and gum and stuff with you, and the inside of that auditorium had such a nice smell. It was all, It always smelled like it was raining outside, even if it wasn't. And you were in the old, only nice, dry, cozy place in the world. I loved that damn museum. I remember you had to go through the Indian room to get to the auditorium. It was a long, long room, and you were only supposed to whisper. The teacher would go first, then the class. You'd be two rows of kids, and you'd have a partner. Most of the time, my partner was this girl named Gertrude Levine. She always wanted to hold your hand, and her hand was always sticky or sweaty or something. The floor was all stone. If you had some marbles in your hand and you dropped them, they bounced like madmen all over the floor and made a hell of a racket. And the teacher would hold up the class and go back and see what the hell was going on. She never got sore, though, Miss Eggletinger. Then you'd pass by this long, long Indian war canoe, about as long as three goddamn Cadillacs in a row, with about 20 Indians in it. Some of them paddling, some of them just standing around looking tough, and they all had war paint all over their faces. There was one very spooky guy in the back of the canoe with a mask on. He was the witch doctor. He gave me the creeps, but I liked him anyway. Another thing, if you touched one of the paddles or anything while you were passing, one of the guards would say to you, Don't touch anything, children. <laughs> they always say that, don't they? But he always said in a nice, nice voice, Don't touch anything, children. Not like a goddamn cop or anything. And you'd pass by this big glass case with Indians inside it, rubbing sticks together to make a fire and a squaw weaving a blanket. Squaw that was weaving the blanket was sort of bending over. And you could see her bosom and all. We all used to sneak a good look at it, even if even the girls, because they were a, uh, only little kids and they didn't have any more bosom than we did. And just before you went inside the auditorium, right near the doors, you passed this Eskimo. He was sitting over a hole in this icy lake and he was fishing through it. He had about two fish right next to the hole that he'd already caught. Boy, that museum was full of glass cases. There were even more upstairs with deer inside them drinking at water holes and birds flying south of the winter. The birds nearest you were all stuffed and hung up on wires. And the ones in back were just painted on the wall. But they all looked like they were really flying south. And if you bent your head down and sort of looked at them upside down, they looked in an even bigger hurry to fly south. The best thing, though, it, in that museum was that everything always stayed right where it was. Nobody'd move. You could go there a hundred thousand times and that Eskimo was so... We just finished catching those two fish. The birds would still be on their way south. The deers would still be drinking out of that water hole with their pretty antlers and their pretty skinny legs, and that squall with the naked bosom would still be weaving that same blanket. Nobody would be different. The only thing that would be different would be you. Not that you'd be so much older or anything. It wouldn't be that exactly. You'd just be different. That's all. You'd have an overcoat on this time, or the kid that was your partner in line the last time had got scarlet fever and you'd have a new partner or you'd have a substitute taking the class instead of Miss Eagle Tinger or you heard your mother and father having a terrific fight in the bathroom or is that what you said your mother? Yeah. Ouch. Well you just passed by one of those puddles in the street with gasoline rainbows in them. I mean you'd be different in some way. Can't explain what I mean and even if I could, I'm not sure I'd, I'd feel like it. Took my old hunting hat in my pocket while I walked and put it on. I knew I wouldn't meet anybody that knew me, and it was pretty damp out. I kept walking and walking. I kept thinking about old Phoebe going to that museum on Saturdays the way I used to. 
I thought how she'd see the same stuff I used to see and how she'd be different every time she saw it. Didn't exactly depress me to think about it. But it didn't make me feel gay as hell either. And, you know, gay as hell meant happy. Certain things, they should stay the way they are. You ought to be able to stick to them in one of those big glass cases and just leave them alone. I disagree. I know that's impossible. Well, in some respects I agree, but I disagree. I agree, but disagree. I know that's hard to understand. Maybe I'll, Mitchell, explain that. I mean, yes, of course, you want, you know, things with your family to stay the same. You know, people die. You don't want that to happen. But you want things to change, too, because you need to learn. Anyway, I kept, uh, I know that's impossible, but it's too bad anyway. Anyway, I kept thinking about all that while I walked. Passed by this playground and stopped and watched a couple of, of very tiny kids on a seesaw. One of them was sort of fat, and I put my hand on the skinny kid's end, sort, sort of even up their weight, but you could tell they didn't want me around, so I let them alone. Then a funny thing happened. When I got to the museum, all of a sudden, I wouldn't have gone inside for a million bucks. It just didn't appeal to me, and here I'd walk through the whole goddamn park and look forward to it and all. Phoebe'd been there, I probably would have, but she wasn't, so all I did in front of the museum... Let's get a cab and go down to the Biltmore. I didn't feel much like going. I'd made that damn date with Sally, though. So end of chapter 16. We are going to stop there. And we will get into chapter 17. And probably 18 in the next video. Chapter 17, 18. 17 is pretty long. So long, 18. I think we'll do chapter 17 and 18 in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, hit that notification bell. And you have a great night. Stay safe and healthy.